Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Saget. Thank you, Brooklyn. Thank you. Look at you. All excited, all hipsters, all smart. All drugged, it's nice to see y'all. Stoned people in the audience, That's, that happens. How many people are stoned right now? <laughs> are you like dealers? What is this? How many people are drunk? I prefer stoned people to drunk people because when the heckle comes out of a stoned person, when you ask them what they say, they, they can't recall. It's like some DVR thing happened. I am really happy to be here. I'm honored you guys all came to this thing. Uh, it's a beautiful space, but enough about my penis. Um, <laughs> sorry, I started with a penis joke. I apologize. I don't want to talk about my dick too much because I don't want to give him a big head. Now, see, let me tell you where that comes from. I'm on a plane and I write down a joke to make people laugh because the world is so screwed up and it's, I can't watch the news, it's upsetting me. I'd rather just talk about everything below my belt and everything's just fine. People, people just laugh, but if I'm on a plane and I'm writing, I don't wanna give my dick a big head, and there's a guy next to me, but he's not looking at my face, and he looks at the, the, the table, and he sees dick, big head, he's scared, he's fucking scared. <laughs> What's next to him? And then he sees it's me, and then he doesn't know what to make of it, because he only knows that I was a dad on a show. <laughs> and that fucking show won't go away. <laughs> It was full house, now it's fuller house. One day it's gonna be fullest house. It's just gonna be me in an urn on the window. <laughs> it's amazing and it's an honor. I'll get the big elephant out of the room. I'm not gonna talk about that show the whole time, but it's the number one show in the world. Uh, I don't know, well, I, I don't know if that's true. I'm just making it up. But, but I knew it was popular years ago because John Stamos, by the way, I have never had sex with him where, uh, where he orgasmed. I tried so hard. Please, Uncle Jesse, please finish, please. Back in the day when he had the mullet, it was just easy, I could ride him anywhere, you know? Oh, whatever, like you didn't think it happened. Um, <laughs> it's a really nice way to start. But we knew we were popular. He and I were one time, uh, or he and I, or he and me? What do you say? Who gives a shit? Grammar's bullshit. <laughs> so Stamos and I were on Main Street in, in Disneyland and Winnie the Pooh was standing next to us. The Winnie the Pooh. And he's right there and he's like angry. He's like, he's all mad, he's all whinnied out. And, uh, and John and I are there, and little kids are coming over, and they're just getting our autographs, and they're ignoring Winnie the Pooh. And I, I knew it. I said, John, look, we're bigger than Pooh. That's a bigger laugh than that. That's okay. I respect you people, because you're smart. And you're, you are, and you know you are. And that's what I like about you. You're arrogant little fuckers. And I appreciate that, because I'm arrogant. No, I'm not. I'm a really good person. But I don't want to offend people. I was doing a show... You know, because there's a duality. I do many different things. I love entertaining families. <laughs> that sounds so creepy. <laughs> I do kid parties. I love entertaining children. <laughs> but I really do love making people laugh because they need it really bad right now. So I just have been hitting stand up hard because it just feels so good to make people feel good. And you can hear the laughter. It comes out in the sound of queefing or whatever the hell. Uh, I don't think that's any points on words with friends, by the way. I've tried. <laughs> it's a big word. But you say big words in Brooklyn. That's what happens here. You gotta talk smart, because you're all hipsters. I know what's going on here. I've played here before, and I had a good time. Got nine people pregnant, that's why I came back. Just wanna just make some support payments. And that's the story of how I met your mother. So, see, I'm known, it's weird. It's just like a pop culture thing to be in this big bird suit that I'm in. So people yell out, full house. You know, they yell that out and someone you yell out, entourage. You know, no matter where I go, everywhere you look, there's a hand to hold on to. Um, but that's, that's a creepy song. That's Stranger Danger. But, um, but some people get disappointed. Like one young lady was sitting in the audience at a show a few weeks ago. This really happened. And it was a few weeks ago. And she said, oh my God, I wanted you to be Danny Tanner. Why aren't you acting like Danny Tanner? And I'm like, what do you want me to do, dust bust? I mean, like hug people, have a cardigan sweater, do the reach around, I don't know. Another girl said, you're not dirty enough. So I pissed on her and, and she liked it. And the VHS tape is climbing up the charts in Russia. It's doing really, really well, like a bullet. But I'm, I, I've had so many relationships. I'm 60 now, I turned 60, me. You're either cheering because you, you think I'm gonna die soon or or I'm a DILF, that could be the other option. I'll go with B, but uh, 
I mean, I don't even know what sex is anymore. I'm so confused. You know, first base used to be what? Handshake or, or what? Or a kiss? What was first base? What is it? Yes. A kiss? No, because I'm 60. It was a handshake. What I, believe, what I believe first base now is, it's anal sex in front of a jet engine. That's what I think it is. <laughs> and then you end, fifth base is a handshake. Thank you so much. That anal sex in front of the jet engine was awesome. Thank you. And I got a woman now. I got a woman. I'm dating a woman. She, she, that's right. She's grown up. You shut up. That's called great audience work. Don't do that. Don't just tell people to shut up. You had something to say. You have a right to say it. What were you saying? That's what you said. I he's stoned because he went, hey, Bob, the first time. And then when I said, what'd you say? He couldn't remember because he's stoned. So he heckled back with, woo, because he's in the backwoods. He lives in the woods. I can see you from here. You got a pretty mouth. What's your name, bro? You can talk to me. I was on the video show. Talk to me. Jake. Jake, that's a cool name. Thank you. All right, take care. <laughs> I mean, what else do I want to know about him? He's stoned, he's here, he's in the back. <laughs> but I, I, got, I got a woman now. I've, had, I've been divorced 20 years. I have a great ex-wife. She's a great mama, baby mama, and she's a good person. <laughs> Can't say anything mean about her unless you have an extra 40 minutes. And uh, that's a joke. She's actually wonderful. And that's nice when you can be friends. Anybody divorced here? No, because you're 12. And that's why I like it, because it makes me feel like I'm doing something dirty. No, I don't want to be dirty. I want to be pure. I do. I want to make people feel good. I want to feel them around, put my pinky in their butt, you know. If somebody's choking, you give them the Heimlich maneuver, right? Anybody know how to do the Heimlich maneuver? See, it's important to know that. I don't know that. I came up with a Heine Lick maneuver. If somebody's choking, I put my tongue in their butt and they throw up everything. And then I throw up, everybody throws up and we're all healthy. It's purging. But you know, you go out and you want to make people laugh and, and that's like the most important thing is, is not to feel the pain of our lives right now. And, and that's what my, my dad imparted upon me and he never touched me. And, um, and we lost him, but we found him. He was behind the shed. But, I learned about everything late. So I learned about the facts of life when I was nine. Do you guys know how babies are born? I don't want to do a spoiler alert for anybody. Uh, anybody learned about uh, how babies are born before nine years old? Good, good. You had appropriate parents. I, this is what happened to me. I was nine years old. I was sitting in front of my house in Norfolk, Virginia. I got my sister there. Are you from Norfolk? No, you ain't. We don't drink, we don't smoke, Norfolk, right? You would know that. It's a Navy town. That's cool that you're from there. Jake, is that you? Are you from Norfolk? Uh, it's my roommate. I don't care. <laughs> your roommate's from Norfolk? Yeah. Are, are you, is your roommate in the Navy? No. Ah. <laughs> I'm a master of crowd work. <laughs> they call it crowd work. It's like, or I'll tell like a stupid joke and then somebody will go, but I'm bump. I'm like, you know what? Fuck you. You didn't try to do a joke. <laughs> trying to make people laugh so they're stupid they were always stupid my dad made me stupid so here's how it happened so i'm sitting in front of my house in norfolk virginia i got my sister there next to her is my cousin brenda she was 10 i was nine she's still a year older than me really cool and um she's sitting there in a tennis skirt with no underwear on and i'm like looking i'm just looking i'm nine i'm interested i'm looking in i'm like what is that a coin bank what the hell is that do you put a, a quarter in that and it's like a little copter in front of the market it moves around i don't know and, and my sister said, Brenda, close your legs. Bobby, stop looking in there. I said, no, I want to see what's in there. And my sister goes, mom. And then my mom runs out of the house all panicked like something terrible's happened. And she goes, what happened? And my sister tells her, Bob was looking inside and looking at the, the unit on the cousin. And my mother calls me in the house and then closes me in the room and locks the vault. You know, it's like crazy. You've got combination. And she's like, Bobby, I'm going to tell you how babies are born, okay? The man puts his penis in the woman's vagina. And I said, how does he get it through the pajamas? <laughs> I said that. And I was wearing a onesie. It was sad. And then I told that on Tonight Show. She's like, why'd you tell that? That's personal information. And stop telling people I wear a Viking helmet and tip plates and culottes. It's embarrassing. I said, people laugh, ma. Worst thing I ever did to my mom uh, that I can talk about was, um, I was on the Tonight Show. I had taken my parents to Israel. And I had my mom, thank you very much, woohoo, one fan of Israel. The rest, we're being profiled and we're in danger. Um, 
but my mom, I took a picture of her on a camel and I showed it on the Tonight Show and said, this is the biggest and hairiest thing my mother has ever had between her legs. Why did you say that, Bobby? Well, it's true, Ma, look at Dad. He's got like a pin dick. I mean, what do you want me to do? So once I found out about the facts of life, my dad was like, thinking he had a 16 year old, but I was nine. So he was telling me jokes he should not have told me. And here's a couple of them. Um, <laughs> nine years old, my dad just told me like dick jokes. And I'm like, why? And what happened was we just had a lot of people pass away. And uh, that's not even funny, because they did. And so to get out of it, we did gallows humor. So my dad would just tell me dirty shit to make me feel better. And he was wrong. <laughs> he made a mistake, because I was nine. I didn't know nothing at all. And now I'm all grown up and I'm on Twitter and people send me dick pics. And then I block them, so I'm a cock blocker. And let us pray. So my dad tells me a joke. My dad says, a man is accused of having sex with a sheep. And I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about. I just found out what sex is. What's the guy making a centaur? Is he, is he a minotaur? What's he making? He's, he's, you can't have I don't, sex with a sheep. And so the guy's accused and there's a trial and the judge says, we have a witness, his 20 year old son that's gonna prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he did not have sex with a sheep. And they bring the kid up and they say, what's your name? And the guy goes, Max, and that's a joke. It's an old joke. So I didn't laugh, I didn't get it. I didn't know what he was talking about. I kind of laughed at the sound of the goat because I like Pinocchio. And you're going to be a real boy. Yeah. And then I, I, 20 years later, a friend tells me the joke and I literally laughed for 10 minutes because it was like, oh my God, that's what it meant? That is fucked up. What was wrong with my dad? And then he told me another one, similarly uh, inappropriate. Uh, you, if you know it, don't worry about it because people know it. Uh, Tarzan meets Jane for the first time and says, meet Tarzan, what name? She says, Jane. He says, what whole name? She says, vagina. <laughs> what whole name? <laughs> what is your whole's name? <laughs> 30 years it took me to understand that joke. I had no fucking clue. So this to me, I'm comfortable here. This is where I'm the most comfortable. This is like being in a living room with you people. I get to talk to you, I get to know about you. I know most of you are in rehab. I'm wishing you the best. <laughs> but I mean, I get, <laughs> if I'm dirty here, if I say anything that offends anybody, basically I'm not like that in my real life. So what I'm telling you is I'm the only television father left that you can trust. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> I don't wear a cardigan sweater and have a pill dispenser and go, hey, 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 I'm not doing that. Want a pudding pop? Now, Bill Cosby, I don't know if you heard about it with all that's going on. I mean, I, with all the politics, that's like a relief. He was one of my idols. That guy was one of my icons. And when you watch an icon fall, I mean, I used to love his work. And, and, and it's just strange. And he now claims that he is legally blind so that he cannot identify women who are saying that he molested them sexually. But if you say that, isn't that like saying that if you weren't blind, that you could identify the women that are accusing you? If I was blind, I could definitely identify women that I had sexually molested. I'd be like, oh, that's not her, Your Honor. Oh, definitely not her. That's her. That's, I know her. That's Kathy. You, oh, she's got a fever. Now you have to write like Sharpie pen numbers on there. But if Bill Cosby was reading Sharpie pen numbers, it would mean he could see them, which means he's not blind. I rest my case. Thank you very much. Well, that didn't deserve that, but thank you. But you just, you just want things to be okay, especially if you have children. I have three beautiful children. They're all old now. They're 85, 72. I got them walkers with little tennis balls on them so they don't skid. Um, as I said, I've been divorced for 20 years. I've had five girlfriends in that amount of time. I was in love with one girl for 25 years, and she's 30 now. So I went to prison. Prison's fucking great. You never know when you're gonna get nailed. It's awesome. Your butt's a fondue pot. It's just fantastic. It's just, it's not bad to be raped if you know the right people. Um, hey, I apologize. I don't want to offend any rapists that might be here tonight. That's an upsetting word to laugh at. But actually, I did meet a woman, and I had five girlfriends. I had to put them all down. 
Um, and I would take like two years off. I would lose my mojo. I don't know what happened. I just, I would concentrate on work and stuff and be a dad. And, and, and I said to a friend of mine, I don't know what to do. I think I lost my mojo. And he, he said, Bob, you got to get back up on the horse. And I said, I want a woman, bro. <laughs> I do have a wonderful girlfriend now. She's a woman. She's, uh, well, in L.A. Hollywood bullshit, it's legally it's supposed to be, you know, half your age plus seven is appropriate for an older man to date a younger woman. But I was, I was doing the plus seven, but I wasn't doing the half your age, so I went to prison again. And, man, they went at me. I had to duct tape my butthole shut. I didn't have to. I just liked it. But this wonderful woman <laughs> that I've met, I'm laughing alone, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> this wonderful woman I met, she's 37, she's grown up, and I, and I wanted to buy her a nice gift. And I said, hey, I got a choice for you here. I can buy you a beautiful chest of drawers, or for the same price, I could get a vasectomy. What do you think? <laughs> and maybe they don't seem to weigh out the same. <laughs> And she said, let's just get the chest of drawers, Bob. And I said, okay. So I bought her this beautiful chest of drawers, and then I slammed my dick in it 1,500 times. <laughs> you know, just so we both get something out of it. <laughs> a friend of mine, my age, uh, married a woman uh, half his age plus seven. He did it correctly. And he just had a baby. And she was uh, pregnant, and I said, may I, may, I, may I feel the baby kick? And she said, yes, Bob, but could you do it externally this time? Because I'm very, very touchy-feely. Anybody got a baby? Anybody got a new baby? You're too young an audience to have a baby? Does your seed not work? Is this just the day after pill crowd? You just leave here and think women are cheering the day after pill. Dude, ladies, it is not just something you do. I had sex with a guy, I'm not sure about him. I think he's on meth from Moscow. I'm taking a day after. Don't do that. Unless I sell it to you and it's got my brand. That's my merch, I sell day after bill. <laughs> How many people were in love? Applaud if you're in love. That's nice, the enthusiasm is deafening. We're in love, we're zombies in love. Love's important, I mean, that's why I, I mean, I, I have been through uh, a lot of shit as a stand-up and you don't always get love, especially if you're a beginning stand-up. For 10 years, um, I was pretty lonely. I had a girlfriend, uh, and then I didn't. And then I was working like the shittiest gigs because that's how you become a comedian. So for 10 years, I was working in really weird places. I, I worked uh, in, a, in a strip club once in Anchorage. And uh, Jay Leno recommended it. He's like, hey, you gotta go. That's my Jay Leno impression. Hey, you gotta go to, I'm, I'm a great impressionist. <laughs> you gotta go to this strip club. They pay cash, Seinfeld's doing it. I'm like, okay, I'll go. What the hell, I got no life. And so this is what happened. There's a stripper on stage and I don't remember much about it, but she's there. She's got little easy bake oven pie pans over her nether regions, which I believe is near Finland, I'm not sure. And she's got scotch taped matches over these areas and she lights the matches on fire and then she does a little dance in her cocaine stupor and then she just blows herself out. And she goes, and now the comedy of Bob Saget. It's like, fucking get me high and shoot me. I did another hell gig. This one's worse. It gets worse. I was in Cleveland. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Are you really from Cleveland? Yes. Oh, wow. What's your name? Sanyo. Where, what is it? Sanyo. Sanyo? Yes. I'm sorry, you have to leave. You know, um... <laughs> That's like a Don Rickles thing. I just stole from my dad. We just lost Don Rickles, by the way. Give him a round of applause. Anytime I talk to the audience and I give them a hard time, especially, and you're Sanyo? Sanyo. S-A-N-Y-O? S-A-N-U. No, I'm sorry, it's spelled S-A-N-Y-O. <laughs> For the purposes of this fucking special, I'm changing the spelling of your name. I can't make fun of your name, my last name is Saget. I can't make fun of you. But it's Sanyo, that's the round, pronunciation? <laughs> that is the proper pronunciation? Oh, baby, look you, you are so beautiful. I was talking about Don Rickles. I loved him so much. Um, and we just, we lost him too soon. He was funny as hell. He wasn't mean. He would talk to an audience. He taught me that you talk to an audience, you give people a hard time, but then you do something nice to them. Like you're laughing, you're not offended yet. You will be, but um, when I bring you up here and strip you naked, you're not gonna like it. And I hit your bare buttocks with a cat of nine tails. 
I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna see his buttocks. I wanna see his back. Um, what? But Don, I directed in the movie Dirty Work, which is Norm MacDonald, Artie Lang movie. Where the fuck were you guys opening weekend? And Don, I wasn't that close with back then when we did that movie, and I hadn't seen him for like a year. And I was in a restaurant, to give you an idea how funny this man was. Um, I was in a restaurant, and Don comes over to me, we're standing in the restaurant, there's people all around, he grabs me by the head, like my head's a little coconut, and he just whispers in my ear, nobody else can hear it, I don't miss you at all. <laughs> and like six weeks before he lost him, I, I called him, I'd gotten very close to him, He's like, he was like a dad to me, and I, I said, how you doing, Don? He says, what do I have to do to get you out of my life? <laughs> Apparently, he, he went too far with it, but, um, <laughs> but Sanyo, you made me think of him because I attacked you for your name, but I, you know, my name got made fun of. My last name's Saget, which rhymes with stuff, you know? <laughs> I didn't grow up and say, hey, I'm gonna, that's gonna be my stage name. <laughs> like, in junior high, they called me Saget the Faggot. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> and you know what I did to stop him? I sucked their dicks, that's what I did. <laughs> I sucked all their dicks. I must have sucked 500 dicks that year. I got out of gym. I got a lot out of gym. He was my coach. One of the weirdest things I ever did was being in Cleveland, where Sonia's from. Uh, how long did you live in Cleveland? Just like four years. Four years, you were just hiding out? <laughs> it's a good place to hide out. Nobody wants to go there. Okay, I'm 24 years old. Everything bad happened at 24 doing stand-up. I'm playing a place, uh, the Cleveland Comedy Club. This is not gonna go well, because this is a film special, and so people are gonna hear about this. It doesn't exist anymore. It's now the parking lot of a stadium. But before it was a comedy club, literally months before, it was a chicken slaughtering house. So it's like, remove the dead chickens, bring in the comics, you know? And so there I was, and um, at that time, lewds were popular. Anybody ever taken a lewd? No, because they don't, you're going, yeah? They don't make them. Would you find one? You dig up an old memory box or something of your, your dad's little time capsule? What's your name, sir? Sai. Sai? What the fuck's going on in here? <laughs> nice to meet you, Sai. You make me want to go. <sighs> <laughs> so you took a lewd? Once. And did you like it? Yes. You did? I'm against that. I'm telling you people as a dad, if you're gonna buy drugs, get them from me. <laughs> no, because lewds, it's like locked in syndrome. You don't know where you are. You get, it's like Wolf of Wall Street. It's Jonah Hill and, and Leo DiCaprio. And it's like, Ooh, it's all slow motion. Like one minute seems like 20. You know, it's like sex with me. It's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> when I'm alone. <laughs> so this is a true story. So the club owner at the club in Cleveland gives me two lewds, and I put them in my pocket, and he says, put them in your pocket because this waitress likes you. And you can give one to her, and then she'll just be unconscious, and you can do whatever you want. And I'm like, I'm not like that, dude. That's for the future. That's, I, I don't do that. I don't, I, I'm just not like that at all. And he says, trust me. And, and I had to stay, not in a hotel, stayed in the comedy club owner's house upstairs in a little tiny room that had a rat in it. Anybody ever had a rat in their house? In their, it's the worst, right? And what is your name, dear? Amelia. Amelia? You had a rat in your house? I've had so many rats. So many rats. I, I've had so many rats. I'm having rat fuck karma right now. I'm having rat trap fever. So, you, 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 tell, tell me the story, Amelia. This is gonna be too long a story. I'm right here for you, I'm right here for you. It's just you and me and all of the people. Anyway, end of the story, is the rat gone? No, I woke up the other day, I woke up. The rat, the rat, the rat. Are you on a lewd? So let me tell you what happened. I'm staying at this, this, this shitty little place. I had to stay upstairs in the room with the rat I go upstairs and then this girl comes upstairs and this is a true story and it makes me feel bad and if she's watching this, I apologize deeply from the bottom of my scrote to the back of your throat. But the thing is, <laughs> I thought I wasn't gonna be blue. I'm working so hard. I really am, I'm going to classes. 
So what, what, what happened was I'm upstairs, she comes up, and I don't want to talk misogynistically or chauvinistically about a lady and her looks, which is a terrible thing to do, but this, this girl, let me tell you what she looked like. Remember Danny DeVito in that first Batman movie? <laughs> he bit the head off a fish, and she had like squid ink coming out of her mouth. She looked like that. And so she comes upstairs and she's like sitting on the bed and I'm just laying there. I got two lutes in my pocket and she's like, hi, Bob. And she's like breathing on me like mackerel and anchovies. It was like a Caesar salad with no lettuce or croutons, you know? It was just not, not good. And then I want to have sex with you. And she was saying like, like smoke's coming out. And, and I said, no, I, I can't do it. And she wouldn't stop. You know what I did? I took a lute. I roofied myself. That's the kind of man I am. And then she left because I was unconscious. And then an hour later, she comes back. And this is really offensive, so I apologize. This is gross. Her breath at this point smelled like a Slim Jim dipped in shit. And she's like, Bob, come on, let's get... And I just went like, no, I took the second loot. I put myself down. I wanted to be out. I didn't want to remember nothing. And I woke up in the morning, and I don't know, I was, my butthole was burning. I think she stuck like a four-hour Dura flame log up there just to get back at me. <laughs> but you do stand up and it's a really nice thing to do because you get to make people laugh. And, and we really need to laugh right now because there's so much crazy shit going on. And, and when, even, even at that time, when I was starting out, I knew that there was like a light at the end of the tunnel. And I got to meet a lot of comedians. I became friends with Rodney Dangerfield, who was someone that helped my career. And so you know him because he's funny as shit. And, and um, when I met him, he had just come out of a spa and uh, he was trying to clean up a little bit because he had some, some habits. So he was proud of them. He loved pot. He said, I'm telling everybody about pot, man. I'm going to smoke it the rest of my life. And I was actually in a hospital room with him the night before he had a surgical procedure, and he was smoking pot. And I said, Rod, you got to stop. It's kind of dangerous right now. He said, what are you talking about, man? I don't care. I said, no, there's an oxygen tank next to you, Rodney. We're all going to die. <laughs> So Rodney, when I first meet him, I'm in a comedy club in San Diego, and he comes in, I don't know him, and he goes, man, I don't know how I'm doing it. I'm supposed to be in a spa, and I'm doing no coke, no booze, no pot, no pills. And I'm like, this guy's fascinating. <laughs> and then he said, I've seen you on TV, man. You're funny, man. You got a Jew head. You know what that means? You're fucked. You're fucked. You can't stop thinking. You're doing jokes all day long. You're fucked. And I'm like, I got a new friend. <laughs> he gets me. And so I knew him my whole career, and, uh, I actually officiated his funeral, and I had a pretty good set. <laughs> and he had two beautiful kids, still does, and, uh, and his, uh, his widow gave me a lovely gift, and this is a true story. Um, she gave me a box that said RD on it, and I opened it up, and there's a pot pipe in there, and that's his pot pipe. And I didn't, I didn't use it, because I just, you know, I knew maybe one day I would give it to uh, San Tropez. And, um, <laughs> Sanyo. Exactly. I don't know why you couldn't remember your own name. <laughs> and then I look further into this little box. This is a true story. You're not going to believe it. There's a bottle of Viagra, and it says Rodney Dangerfield Viagra. That's a $2 million eBay item right there. And there was one pill in it that was 10 years old. People, don't take a 10-year-old Viagra. I'm telling you right now. Has anybody ever taken Viagra here? Someone said yes on television. <laughs> Most people would never say a word because if they're with someone that they have sex with and they go, yes, I take Viagra, they go, what the fuck? <laughs> I thought those were real erections. No, honey, I use, I, I use a pipe cleaner and duct tape to make it dog leg left. <laughs> sir, you have taken Viagra? Where are you? Raise your hand, sir. Raise your penis. Um, and, and what is your name, sir? If you say Sanyo, I'm going to shoot you in the fucking face. <laughs> what is your name? Yeah. Jack? That makes sense. Uh, and why? Jack, um, what was the occasion for the Agra? Was it a special occasion? Was it a birthday? You can't last. This is amazing. We're on television. This is fucking awesome. Jack, you're sitting here like a jury in the OJ trial right now. You're telling a room full of people that you just can't last. That's just, and, and you got a little Jake Gyllenhaal in you, you got it going. Is that how you say his name, Gyllenhaal? <laughs> Gyllenhaal, is it Gyllenhaal? Don't matter, he can't get a hard on. Who gives a fuck what Jake's name is? 
You're a good looking guy, you can't last it. You take them right there, you take them orally. Don't put them in the pee hole because I call it a pee hole, by the way. It's gonna be in my TED talk. I know it's called a urethra, but she's my favorite singer and she's retiring. So, well, here's a story that happened to me. I had never taken a Viagra before. And so I had a bottle that said Rodney Dangerfield's Viagra with a 10 year old pill in it. And I was in between relationships and I was in a bar this happened about eight years ago, I guess. And this girl says to me, come on, let's go to your house. Let's hang. And that's what, you know, a millennial says to an older man. Uh, <laughs> let's hang. All he does is hang. He can't get it up. <laughs> what am I gonna do? I feel so bad for you right now. I feel worse for your wiener. His wiener. <laughs> Ted talk. So, so I don't know what to do. We're in the, we're in the den, we're hanging out. And I, I needed to do something because little Bob wasn't feeling it. He looked at me like, like Shemp Howard from the Three Stooges. He was just going, me, 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 just making noise. You don't need to know the reference or nothing. Just know that's the sound my dick made. So I run upstairs and I open a drawer and I find the Rodney Dangerfield 10 year old Viagra. And like a moron, I took it. Don't do shit like that. I go downstairs, an hour goes by. I don't get an erection but my eyes started to bulge out of my head. And I started to talk like, I got no dick, no dick at all. I'm gonna put a bag over my dick in case your bag breaks. <laughs> so nothing happened. And, uh, but I, I, then I, years went by and now that I'm 60, I went, you know, I should have a supply, I think. I mean, you're supposed to, like, when you're older, if you wanna perform, and I love performing. Um, <laughs> so I actually went to my doctor I went to a few doctors. I got my prostate checked, first of all. That's what happens when you get older. Anybody ever had their prostate checked? No, because you're 12. <laughs> I, I had it checked. Is it a bad uh, prostate exam doctor if while he's giving it to you, both of his hands are on your shoulders? Is that a bad doctor? <laughs> and you look at in the mirror and he's like winking at you and saying, call me. <laughs> I went to a doctor and I said, uh, what's up? And he said, hey, uh, take down your pants. I want to look at your penis. And I said, you're my eye doctor. <laughs> I went to a real doctor and I said, I think I want Viagra. And he said, Bob, let me tell you something. The problem's not between your legs, it's between your ears. And it's true, because his testicles were in my mouth. And... <laughs> Is that in poor taste? <laughs> I actually keep my testicles in Tupperware in the freezer and I burp them every now and then. You burp Tupperware. I put my little balls on my, on my shoulder and I burp them at night. My balls burp, but <laughs> I put them back. This is just for me. And then I put them back in the freezer and I freeze my balls. Freeze my balls off. Boy, you guys got weird weather. I don't know if you heard there's climate change. And uh, I'll get back to that other story. Don't you worry, none. But it's weird because it's so cold. I was playing Winnipeg. I was doing stand up there and it was like negative 20. And I'm gonna, this is gross, as opposed to anything else I've said, but I, I, it's gonna be personal, but I'm sorry, I'm in a safe space with a bunch of cameras. And I said, I, I, I had a hemorrhoid. And uh, it was, thanks for laughing at that, thanks. And it was so cold, it broke off and rolled down my leg like an ocean spray cranberry. And then a little fucking rabid little Canadian Winnipeg squirrel came up and just picked it up and started eating it like a fucking apple. And he looked at me like, fuck you, I'm eating your frozen fucking hemorrhoid. Stupid asshole. Fucking rabid squirrel. Shouldn't have told that story. So anyway, so I go to get a prescription of Viagra filled. This is a totally true story. It happened in my neighborhood, so you know it's the truth. And I go into the drugstore, and that's all I went in there to pick up. But then I see a little bottle of travel hairspray, and I bought that because I like to look nice for the people. And I put the, put, for the people. So I, I put the travel hairspray right on the pharmacy counter. And then I said, I'd like my prescription, please. And she puts the, the, the Viagra on the counter and then she, she was cool about it. She didn't yell it out like you see in comedy movies that rip off Woody Allen. And she said to me, uh, okay, uh, with the copay, your prescription is $1,200. $1,200 for Viagra. And I went, no. I had righteous indignation. No, no. I'm just gonna use the hairspray. Thank you very much. I didn't realize that came out weird or what she thought, but she's like staring at me, creeped the fuck out. She's thinking, 
that what I'm saying is that instead of Viagra, I'm just gonna take travel hairspray and just do it up. Just, just freaking get that thing all just gleam the cube. Just shellac that fucker. Just get a lathe. Just get a Build-A-Bear hat, put it on the end of it for Lent. And so I, I, I didn't get it. And I just, uh, and now I met somebody that I don't want to talk about because I would never talk about my problems like you in public. <laughs> I talked about a lot of stuff about death and dying a lot in this book I wrote. New York Times bestseller, but uh, you probably didn't read it. Uh, it's called Dirty Daddy. And uh, there's an audio, really? A person read it, thank you. Brooklyn's so smart, one person read it. Um, it's a seven hour audio book, so if you don't want to roofie somebody, just play it, they'll fall asleep right away. My voice, that'd be awesome. But it's interesting, I, um, I had to investigate about book writing and learning and reading and... And, <laughs> and I, uh, I was gonna go on The View to co-host The View. They wanted me to interview an author. And I wanna tell you something, every single one of you one day will co-host The View. <laughs> That's just how the world works. One day, Jake will be on the fucking view. And they'll be sitting there, and they'll say, what do you do, Jake? And they'll go, woo! Where are you from? I don't know, my friend's from Norfolk, Virginia. So I had to go on the view. So they wanted me to interview an author. Guess who they picked? E.L. James, Fifty Shades of Grey. That's who they had me interview. That was a mistake. You guys like the book, Fifty Shades of Grey? Pretty, pretty not much. Well, I had to read it, and I was on the plane. I had to read it overnight because I was on the show the next day, so I had to cram it. So cramming's difficult. I had to lube it up, very painful, and I crammed it is what I'm saying. So I'm on the plane, and I'm reading Fifty Shades of Grey. I had the soft cover, and as I held it, it became the hardback. And I've got the book with the Christian Grey tie, the whole thing, professional book. Ed Asner gets on the plane. Ed Asner, Mary Tyler Moore's boss, Lou Grant. If you don't know him because you're so millennialish, uh, he was the old man in Up. Oh, we like him. He's kind of a Karamudgian. And I had directed him once in a snuff film, and he was great. Um, no, it wasn't a snuff film because we didn't have the budget for tractors. But um, expensive. Actually, it was a Lifetime movie, which is the opposite of snuff. We put people together. And so... Ed Asner gets on the plane, and I, I know the man for real, and uh, okay, Bob, we get it, who cares? So he comes on the plane, and he sees me reading this book. He goes, how you doing, Bob? Then he sees the book, and he goes, what the fuck you reading that shit for? That's bullshit, that's what's wrong with the world. It's fucking dirty shit. I said, no, Ed, I'm on The View tomorrow. I'm interviewing E.L. James. He says, I don't give a shit, fuck that shit. Good to see you, Bob. <laughs> and he sits down in front of me, and he just fell asleep, and I didn't care, I loved him. I gave him a, a tip massage as he was laying there. They brought his sandwich, I threw it back in the coach. He didn't know what was going on. They fought over it back there. I was like Mad Max. I've never been to coach, but I hear it's crazy back there. So the next day I'm on The View. I'm sitting there with the ladies, and I actually said this, and then he didn't bleep it. I said, I couldn't put your book down. It was stuck to my hand. Yeah, they laughed at that, because they're dirty. So people tell me jokes all the time, which is like a nice thing. It's nice if they're good jokes and it's an exchange program. Uh, <laughs> Russell Crowe came over to me. You like Russell Crowe? Yeah, I like him. I like name dropping a lot. I'm a real showbiz asshole. Uh, but I really like Russell Crowe and he's really cool. He came over, he had numbers and letters floating around his head. He's got a beautiful mind. And he, he comes over and he goes, hello, Bob Saget. I'm Russell Crowe. And I said, I, I know. He says, I have a joke for you, Bob Saget. I said, you, you can call me Bob. He said, okay, Bob Saget. Here's the joke. What did the man say to his doctor? And the man had five penises when his doctor asked him how his shorts fit him. And I knew the joke because I'd heard it in junior high. So I said that they fit like a glove and he got pissed. He said, you gave away the punchline. You weren't supposed to give away the punchline, Bob Saget. Then he ripped off his suit and he had a gladiator spangled outfit on. He took out a scythe and he gutted me and he yelled, freedom! Sorry, wrong guy. <laughs> this is just, uh, this is nice. Cause you know, it's, uh, it's been a rough couple years for me, to be honest with you. Um, 
We buried my mom a couple years ago. She's alive, but we buried her and <laughs> put in a put in a funnel and poured Red Bull and Boost in there. Um, <laughs> that's what I learned from my dad. Just make a joke at the worst time and it'll get you out of it. And I did lose my mom. And uh, it's a little bit of a downer, but I'll just tell you the truth of it and how we dealt with it. Um, she was 89 and she got really cool at the end of her life. I actually wanted her to live another 10 years because I could finally tolerate her. It was so cool. <laughs> and, and she was really adorable. And this is going to get a little weird. It's going to be a little like psycho with the Anthony Perkins, uh, you know, impression. Because I, I, I can't help but do her voice when I talk about her. And uh, her name was Dolly. And so this is uh, three years ago. Uh, she started to get sick. And she said, Bobby, I'm at peace with this. I'm okay. It's my time. She was so cool. She was like Yoda. I mean, a lot she, like Yoda. She was green. She was about that tall. <laughs> she was talking backwards. Eat the salmon, you must. It's for the company. <laughs> I'm sitting there with her, and she's like, I want you to know something, Bobby. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to give you a sign. And I said, Mom, please don't do that. <laughs> I said, I'm scared of ghosts. You know I am. Please don't do it. I'm going to do it, Bobby. I'm going to come back, and you'll know it's me. I said, Mom, you're getting agitated. No, I'm not going to come back as a, as a... And she looks around the room, and there's a bar of Dove soap sitting on the nightstand. And she says, I'm going to come back as a Dove. And I'm like, oh, fuck, she's doing death improv. <laughs> and I'm like, Mom, don't do that. You're going to see a Dove, and you'll know it's me. It'll be a Dove, and it'll be me. And now I am scared to death of Doves. <laughs> I don't want to go to a wedding. I don't want to see a magician. I'm afraid I'm going to be on vacation. The shutters are going to open. There's going to be a dove there. And just to drive the point home, it's going to have a bar of dove soap in its mouth. It's going to drop the soap, which tightens up my butthole. And then it's going to go, hello, Bobby. <laughs> Fucking dove. And I'm going to go, Mom, I said no. Next thing you know, she's in my car. Make a left. I got to go to CVS. Nothing's changed. I got to buy moleskin for those areas that rub me raw. It's like, oh, my God. The fuck happened to me? I'm in purgatory and Scuttle is my mother. <laughs> Scuttle, Little Mermaid bird, right? Scuttle? <laughs> you like Little Mermaid? <laughs> you realize she was 16 in that movie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're a dirty, dirty girl. <laughs> and then at the end, she's 17 when she gets her legs. Oh, sorry, spoiler alert. But <laughs> that Eric, he's, he's, he just went and went, robbed the cradle. I like Belle. Belle was my favorite Disney character. Did you like Belle? Yeah. See, that's good. Who else were your favorite Disney heroines? Jasmine. Jasmine. Jasmine's not allowed in the country. I'm sorry. She's... <laughs> I didn't do it. Who else? Who else did you like? Mulan. Mulan. Mulan's at the airport. She can't get in. <laughs> we're waiting for her papers. Pocahontas is not legal. She doesn't have paperwork. She's not American. You know who Bill Cosby's favorite heroine is? It's Sleeping Beauty. That's the <laughs> joke that fits right there. You are such a nice audience. I did not expect you to be such a nice audience. I thought there'd be some assholes in here, but there just aren't. Jake. Hey, Jake, want to do me a favor? Jake, uh, why, don't you, why don't you come up here? Come on up here. Just go around the sun. Follow this guy. And I'm gonna get a stool. I'm gonna get a stool. I can't believe I'm holding my stool in front of you. That's right, I did a stool joke. What about Jake right here? Is Jake coming up? Wow. You're exactly as I pictured you. Hey, thanks for coming up. Must be really hot outside. It's a pleasure to meet you. I don't wanna give you difficult. I like this just in case really late tonight you need them. Yeah, so I can, so I can. Why don't you sit there on this uh, thing that's been cleaned? You're not as I expected you. But you look like you could be related to me. You look like you'd be my kid. Sure, sure. And, and you... This is not what I expected. And you... Where, where are you from originally? Dallas. Ah, and when did you come here to Brooklyn? Three years ago. And do you love it here? Mm-hmm, I do. That's good. You're not trashing Dallas, are you? No, not at all. Don't do that, because that state can secede whenever it wants. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll, I'll talk to somebody in the audience and they'll yell stuff out like you were, and then it makes me feel, you know, like I want to parent them, like I don't want to teach them something, you know? Because all the time when I was on that family show that's still on, because it's never going away, 
I would talk to my daughters. And when I had stuff to talk to my daughters about, I would sit them down. And as I would talk to them, it was like a morality play. All of a sudden, like synthesizer music would come in. I can almost hear it now, like you're, like you're one of my daughters, like you're Michelle or DJ or Steph. There it is. And that's background music that helps you teach something to somebody. Now, do you have a career you like? Do you have a job you like? I'm an actor. Are you acting like now, right now, like you're wearing clothing this evening? I am. Well, I wish you the best with acting, because as you know, most people have a huge success rate in it. Um, and I don't want to make funny. I want to talk to you just about a couple of things here. Um, what would you say is the craziest thing that you've ever done in your life? Been on stage with Bob Saget. So you are in the moment, my friend. What's the craziest thing you did as a kid? Because I was like crazy. I was like a dry humper. I didn't mean to say that right into your face and look at you. That's creepy. Creeped me out, creeped you out, creeped everybody out. Did you ever do that when you were young? Did you ever do the dry humping? I did. Shame on Shame on you on television, telling everybody. How old were you when you started? 14. You finished, you finished yesterday. You know that's dangerous. Now this music, it's like a public service announcement for you right now. Like I would go on with a commercial during Dancing with the Stars. Hi, this is Bob Sag with a public service announcement. Don't dry hump. And let me tell you why, and you didn't know this. 14 years old, you say? Mm -hmm. You can wear the skin off your wiener. That's a truthful thing. And if that, that's right. Someone's really laughing heartily at that, which makes them strange. But if you wear the skin off your wiener, if you look up skinless wiener and you Google it, it just shows the thing on the grill that's falling apart. And let me tell you something else. Have you ever spent time out in the woods? You can tell me, Jake. I have. I feel like I know you so much right now. You spent time alone in the woods? No. So people watched what you did in the woods? Yes. You're a bad boy. Let me tell you what never to do. And if people are watching this and you got like a 14, 15 year old kid at home, you tell them not to do stuff in the woods. Not to dry up, because you could go up to a tree and you see a knot hole in a tree and you're all by yourself. That's a knot hole. That's not a hole. You kids at home, that's not a hole. You don't put your wiener in that hole because you don't know what could happen. Now stay with me on this, because I'm not quitting. <laughs> if you've got a hole in a tree and the tree's in the ground, that's a whole song. Don't touch me. And, <laughs> and your wiener's in the hole. You know what can happen? I don't. Grubworms, ticks, all kinds of bugs. Ladybug can go right in your little pee hole, TED Talk. They can go right in there and you can be ruined. <laughs> What acting, oh my God, what an actor. But it's true, it's true, you can be ruined. And if there's sap in the tree, it'll cauterize the end of your wiener. And the next thing you know, one of your balls just swells up like a cantaloupe. And then you're home on like Yom Kippur and it pops open. And then you, you're ruined. That's only if you're celebrating Yom Kippur. Cause you know, cause you repented. So don't do it. I just scared the living shit out of you, didn't I? You actually did. Well, I can't tell you how much I wish success for you in acting, because I don't want to. Is there anything else you'd like to say to me at all before, before I ask you to get the hell out of here? No, no, thank you. I want to thank you, and I, you know what I wish for you uh, in your future is, uh, is clothing. I wish clothing for you. Give him a big round of applause. He's a nice man. Thank you. Take care of yourself. And fucking get dressed next time you come to a show. He, got, he bought his clothes at Baby Gap. I got to meet a lot of people here tonight. Now, I would actually like to do some music for you because I got some new songs I'd like to do. Um, and I like doing them. They make me feel good and I think people like them. And this is, uh, thank you very much. This is the, uh, the son of Mumford and Sons just handed me this. You can leave now. Uh, he actually acted just now. He walked away rejected. That's adorable. You guys are incredibly nice, honestly. I really love being here. I'm not fucking around. Um, it's just, I straighten myself. 
This is a song I wrote. I have a lot of new love songs, and they're all offensive. And um, I hope you like it. This is a new one. Uh, they're all new. What the fuck? And, uh, and here it is. I recently dated a woman. We went to dinner and then to a bar. All she wanted to do is arm wrestle. She kicked my ass and lit up a fat cigar. She was so sweet, so kind, so full of ambition. And as we tapped our champagne glasses, she said, I have something to tell you. I'm in transition. <laughs> she was transitioning. Not a matron nor a mate, she was transitioning. That put a skid mark on our date. I didn't judge her. And it would have been rude to go. Her name was Helen. She said six months ago, it was Joe. But we had fun, we talked of love, what life's about. How the thing she wanted most was to turn her penis inside out. That's when dessert came. Our date was coming to an end over the cherries jubilee. We decided we'd be better off as friends. Funny she was my type, I mean anatomically almost my type, completely. <laughs> Common interest, we had it all. And as she held me hard good night, she said she really had a ball. Two of them, they were like wiffle balls, they were firm. They dented me, I had the ice. She looked like Brooklyn Decker, except she had a pecker. And I always will respect her. Invited her to my next show And that's the story Of a girl named Helen Who six months ago Was Joe True story This is a song I wrote just for tonight Yep, that's right. Yeah, I wrote it on a, I, well, it started on a plane. I was on one of those small planes. I was in first, because, you know, I got no choice. And I had a Bloody Mary, and the flight attendant seemed kind of cute. And, and I was in between relationships, because I'm not a cheater at all, except for the people that I cheated on. And no, I'm not. Don't cheat, by the way. Don't cheat. Does, it, do anybody, does anybody here cheat? <laughs> this has turned into a church revival. <laughs> So I wrote this song, and I, I got a crush on the flight attendant. I don't know what happened. I just did, and I thought she was really pretty, and, um, and I had a Bloody Mary, and then I had another one, and I wrote this song, and I wrote it just for tonight, and you'll know when it begins that it's just for tonight. And it's a sing-along, so I need your help, so I'll be begging for it. I got on board, was looking forward to my show in Brooklyn tonight. See, Brooklyn, see? That's right, show the enthusiasm for your town. I sat in first class, but it smelled like ass of the old man to my right. But I forgot about that old man stink when a pretty lady came over and said, hey, Bob, would you like a drink? Her hair was blonde and her shoes were pink. The girl who wore the wings reached across, pulled out my tray, handed me a warm washcloth. She said, I always give these to my man. I like to wipe him off. She gave me nuts. They were heated up. She said, I assume you like yours hot. That stopped my heart, and I heard a fart. The old man's pants were sharded. Everybody sing. The old man's pants were sharded. How did you learn it that quick? You're geniuses. The old man's pants were sharded. You sound like angels. The old man's pants were sharded. The old man's pants were sharded. Now it's sad first class. Smelled like boiled egg gas. She asked me if I'd like some cheese. I said, no, I'm good. But if you could, bring him a diaper and some Febreze. She got down low so I could hear. She said, I've seen stranger things. I knew a captain whose pants were crapped in. 
That's how I earned these wings. Everybody, the old man fans were sharded. Sharded is a combination of shit and farted. The old man fans were Tell your kids one day. The old man fans were sharded. Oh, it's like a church revival. The old man fans were Here's the romantic part, but that man's shart, that's the romantic part, was the very start of our flight attendant fling. His soiled pants got me my first dance with the girl who wore the wings. The girl who wore the wings has smelled most everything. I mean, think about it. She's in a jump seat right next to the crabber. You never know, Jake could be sitting in there eating a Subway sandwich, just blasted all over the walls, sitting there stinking up. Now she smells like Jake's butt, and I'm still attracted to her, which means what? I'm attracted to Jake's butt? That's fucked up. I've always had a thing. Give Jake applause for the group. You guys are nice. Um, I wanted to write a song, and I don't know. I have a friend, I won't say who it is, Ben Folds, and he said, <laughs> he said, your voice sounds like Neil Diamond sometimes. I said, no, it doesn't. And then he said, yes, it do. And so I decided to write a Neil Diamond song, and I'm hoping he doesn't sue me. So it's not really his tune, so I'm gonna do it. So here it is, and I hope you like it, and it's offensive. About a relationship that didn't work. It's all just a running theme. What did I do? What did I say? I wanted her back, not mess it up again. But she had a thing hanging out of her nose, and I couldn't just leave it there, hanging by a lonely hair. And so I pulled it. And she never forgot the pain I just yanked it I think it may have been part of her brain After that, things just weren't the same But she went out with me again A week later I took her to dinner, all she wanted was some soup I suggested the spicy gumbo Right there in her chair, she took a poop That's right, she pooped her pants Right there in her seat she had no other chance. I mean, the bathroom was like 50 feet. <laughs> Thanks to her bad memory, we went out once more. I took her skydiving. She said she'd never been before. Her chute didn't open, <laughs> but she landed in a lake and she didn't drown. Thank God her boobs were fake. <laughs> She's like a buoy, like a buoy, like a buoy. She was bouncing up and down. I went out to save her. I dried her off and took her into town. I thought things were good for us. All of a sudden, she got hit by a bus. Now I really miss her. You know what? Now I'm dating her sister. And I can't wait to kiss her as soon as she gets rid of all those blisters that she got from her mom and dad cause they live in the woods and it gives me wood and that ain't no Thank you. Anybody drinking and driving tonight? I'm sorry? Subway. Subway. You're gonna drink in Subway. Well, I hope you have a good time on that Subway. You people don't need me anymore. So this, what bro? We always need you, man. You always need me? Well, then I will always be here for you. I love you, too. You're awesome. You're just awesome. You made this a really fun special. I've never had an audience chant Bobby. Bobby, 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 Bobby. Who's the guy that was the dad? Who's 
the guy that spanks your ass. No, uh, this song is called We Gotta Be Kind to Each Other, and it's, that's your chorus. You're gonna say that if you would, because it's about trying to just make people have fun and have a good time and uh, get through this life that can be difficult at times. So I wrote this song, kind of want to do my own We Are the World, if you will, or, or give peace a chance, you know, something like that. So this is it, and I uh, hope you like it and enjoy it thinking about it on the subway. Here we go. I can't watch the news, yet every night I do. I don't know what's real or fake, but I know what love is and hate's a mistake. And I don't want to judge anyone, cause judging's mean. But we gotta be kind to each other, whether you're purple, pink, or green, like my penis. That's not true. I do not have a green penis. It was one Easter, I was in between two eggs, and I was just painting it. That's not true, I fucked a turtle. Here's the chorus. We've got to be kind to each other. Go. We've got to be kind to each other. Love you. We've got to be kind to each other. we got to be kind to each other. Our kids are hearing lies, and they all need the truth. Everyone's a spy. Even Jake's got Russian microfilm hidden in his meth-rotted tooth. So I don't know. Maybe you don't. Women deserve equal pay for the same job as a man. But if she brings a donkey in the room, I'll throw in an extra 10 grand. I've done it. It's not good, because they're big. Donkey, you don't want to be around that. It's got like a kneecap in the middle of it. We gotta feed our tired, our hungry, and our poor. And stay away from the woman next door. I didn't, and my wiener's still sore. That's how it got green. That's what it was. We gotta be kind to each other. Take it. We gotta be kind to each other. Yeah, we gotta be kind to each other. We gotta be kind to each other. If your mama is black and your papa is brown, if your 40 year old man in a white wedding gown, if you're working in porn as a part time fluffer, if you live in the woods and your sister's your mother. Got to be, 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 got to kind. To every single motherfucking one of us, except Jay, because he's a douchebag like no other. That's not true, because I love you, Jay. Love you so much, even more than my own family. I love the way you dress. I love the way you don't dress. I love all of you. I love Sanyo. I love the guy that can't make his dick work. I love all of you, all of you, all of you, all of you, except for two of you and that poor fucking loser that's gotta take the subway. We gotta be, gotta be, gotta be, gotta be kind to each other. Thank you, everybody. It was so much fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sonia, you're the man. You're awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. So much fun.